Thank you. To be here at the TED Talks where ideas change the world. How fantastic is that concept? I was born in Bradford and grew up an ordinary life, uh, went to a comprehensive. I certainly never imagined I'd ever have an idea, let alone an opportunity like this to possibly change the world. I left school at 16. Uh, I got a normal job, I got married, and I actually thought that was all I would do. I had no aspirations to do anything else. I enjoyed my job and I enjoyed my life. So how do you go from that satisfied life to becoming a world record-breaking polar explorer? <laughs> it was the birth of my triplets. <laughs> you never expected that, did you? <laughs> I had children, and pretty much I brought them up on my own. Uh, my, my marriage sort of dissolved when they were uh, three, but even at the beginning, I had no family around. So when they were 18 months and I had done it, I thought I could do anything. And I was shown an advert that asked for ordinary women to apply to be part of the first all-female team to walk to the North Pole. So I thought, wow, I've got all those attributes. Never had walking boots on my feet. I've never had a rucksack on my back, but I'm an ordinary woman. Hey. <laughs> so I went down to Dartmoor. Over 200 women applied. They were all outward-bound instructors, hardy, mountaineers, true, real outdoor types. I was annihilated. Sobbing, didn't know what I was doing there. But I caught a dream of... Wow, I could make this team, or is it possible? And we all have that choice when we're faced with something really difficult. Do we go for it? Do we take that step and, and really make an action, or does it always just become something we wished we'd done? Well, thankfully, they didn't choose the team, and I was given nine months to plan for it. So I spent nine months with baby triplets. I asked the local gym, because I didn't have any money either, to sponsor me. I put the triplets in a crest for an hour and a morning while I worked out. And on a night, on an afternoon rather, babies sleep. So no coffee for me. I was on the patio. My neighbours thought I was mad. I was in press-ups and running around the garden. Anything to make me fit and strong. Friends taught me how to read a map. So in nine months' time, I went back down to Dartmoor and I got on the team. I changed from being the pathetic one to knowing what I was doing. Wow, how amazing was that for me? That was the biggest accomplishment I think I've ever done, never mind any world record. So we went out in 1997 to the Arctic. Um, I am going to talk about our corrosive seas, but my actual journey started on the Arctic Ocean, and it was here that I fell in love with the Arctic. I was on the first leg of the journey. It was a relay, five teams of four women with two guides, Matty and Denise, and I was the first leg. We spent 17 days on the ice, and it was during those 17 days I learned about the Arctic Ocean and traveling. Um, and it was a mind-blowing experience. The Arctic Ocean, you're actually walking on water. It's blues, it's pinks from the ice, you get the blacks. It crunches, it moves, you have squeaks and huge booms. It's like walking in a crystal beast. And for me, it was love and I found what I was meant to do. I finished that, came home, and unfortunately that was when uh, the marriage broke down. And so I'm now single with no money, how can I change my life? <laughs> Things were slightly tricky. And so I called the other girls up, and there was a plan to become the first British women to walk to the South Pole. It hadn't been done before. So five of us, unlikely heroes, five middle-aged women, we taught ourselves how to navigate with the sun, and we followed each other for 61 days across Antarctica. Ferocious winds in our face, they're always in your face, so if you leave any part of your skin exposed, it will freeze. And we followed each other step after step. 
remembering the heroes of old. And then eventually, after 61 days, we arrived at the South Pole base. We were the first British women as part of all, all women teams. And it was here I got to know that scientists actually work out here and do great deeds. And I began to understand a little bit more about the planet rather than it being about science. But for me, this wasn't to be my beginning with science. I had that big dream to do the North Pole, the whole thing. We'd done a relay, but in a women's group had gone from land to the North Pole. I asked Caroline and Pom, and quite understandably, they at first were reticent. To put it in context, since Cook in 1908 claimed the North Pole, only 53 expeditions when we left had actually made it from land. 53, when you think of the thousands going up Everest, that's the difficulty of what we were facing. We set off in 2002. We left from Ward Hunt Island, Ellesmere Islands there, to walk to the North Pole in the middle of the ocean. I thought I knew what to expect. I'd been on the first leg of the original journey. But when we set off, the temperatures for the first 27 days were unprecedented. They were between minus 42 and minus 56 on the thermometer. It's not wind chill. With wind chill, and we couldn't take it because everything froze, all our equipment, you're talking minus 70s. In those temperatures where there's nowhere to hide, you're fighting for survival, you're fighting for every inch you move. And you're working in that environment in a moving landscape, hauling 300 pound sledges behind you. I began to realize why so few people ever made this journey. Let me tell you, Jeremy Clarkson did not get there in a Land Rover. <laughs> not that it annoys me or anything. <laughs> the terrain is not flat like Antarctica. It moves, it grips, it, it changes. You're, you're hauling yourself across really difficult ice boulders. And as you get a step forward, you're being taken backwards. We had some other issues to deal with, polar bears out there. Because of weight reasons, we didn't think toilet paper was a necessity. It was too heavy. You know, life's quite grim at minus 60 when you've got to wipe your bottom with ice wedges. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> we had long days. We had storms. We had three major storms where we could just huddle under tent material and do nothing, little bits of food and drink. And on day 37 of a trip that we had been given a window, there's a window of opportunity before the ice melts too much, we had gone literally 69 of the 500 miles we had to go. Everybody wrote us off, not surprisingly. There were many times we did. We extended the days, but because of the severe cold and the storms and the things we couldn't do, we had suffered from many physical injuries. I had a little bit of frostbite that caused me major problems. Pom, 47 days she skied on frostbitten, gangrenous feet to keep the expedition alive. Normally I get rid of it quick, but in memory and just because she was so brave, I'm just gonna let you suffer a bit more. <laughs> On day 47, we had a resupply plane, and, and Pom gave up her dream so that we could keep going. When she left, we had a lot of open water we had to cross. Uh, we swam in the ocean. Uh, we put our suit on. That was pretty terrifying, and we literally got in to swim across the open water. We, that suit was designed by a very famous Norwegian called Borger Ausland, who's done many things, and he allowed us to have the copyright to have it made. So we were at the first, now they use it a lot. Um, so that was an amazing thing to do. But eventually, we did it, the 1st of June, <laughs> way! <laughs> Wow, I'll tell you, if you're collecting happy, that was happy. <laughs> it was a world record, goodness me. That's never been repeated. I don't think it will because the ice is disappearing so fast. And I got it, but I fell in love 
with the nature and I wanted to do something. So I know a visionary that not many people know and his name is Penn Haddo. And he's a visionary because he wanted to set up a scientific expedition to help scientists understand the Arctic Ocean. He's more of a visionary because he chose this girl, a girl, to lead his team across the ice. Who the hell does that if you're a guy and you're a big polar explorer? And he chose me to go to the front of his team, even though he was on it, because he was collecting the science, even though he has enough skills to do it himself. And this first expedition was to measure the thickness of the ice cap. Because people talk about the extent, but if it's not more than two metres, it will disappear in the summer, and therefore the ice is getting less and less. So he asked me if I would lead from the front, find the path for 73 days. And on top of that, Martin Hartley, who's a very famous polar uh, explorer, he's taken photographs of ran finds, and he's actually on the ocean now, he was to take photographs. Because what's the point in finding out this information? Yes, it's vital and it's great that we know, but what's the point if we don't do anything with it? We don't change the world. We don't tell the people that are not scientists. So Martin took over 3,000 photographs that we shared with the world. On a night, Penn got out his drill and he drilled and we actually measured it with a tape measure. We found new ways to cross water. And at the very end, David Shookman came in and we hit the news of 10 and we were able to share that experience. But it wasn't until 2010 that Penn dragged me back out again to lead the next Catlin Arctic survey that I learned about ocean acidification. Now, I'm not a scientist, so believe me, this will be simple. <laughs> And what our job this time was, was to go and collect samples. So again, I found myself at the front of a team. Charlie was collecting the science and Martin was taking the photographs. But this time as I crawled across thin ice, the boys always sent me across first. They deemed I was the lightest. <laughs> uh, I knew that there was so much going on with our oceans underneath this ice. We crossed a lot of thin ice. And what happens is as we emit, more carbon dioxide. Since the Re Industrial Revolution, our oceans are actually changing at an unprecedented level. The carbon dioxide that we emit, around 30% goes into the oceans. And it's always happened, you know, goes in the air, goes in the plant life, and goes in the oceans. And the oceans have been able to act as a buffer, but at a cost. And since the Industrial Revolution, this is changing the chemistry of our oceans. In the Arctic Ocean, already, they're becoming more corrosive, and it's already causing problems with the minutiae of the ocean. As the carbon dioxide goes into the salt water, it forms a weak acid called carbonic acid, and this is what's causing a problem. And it's a huge problem, and we don't know enough about it. We know a lot about the land, we know a lot about the ice caps, but we know very little about what's happening to the seas. So we went on forward and we had many storms and we had to collect this water and we had to keep it unfrozen. And the man is in this audience who made the box in, this, uh, in that sledge and he designed it on Dartmoor and it was just a cool box with heated plates so that we could keep the water unfrozen and take it to the scientists. The world has 70% covered in water. What happens at the top of the world in the Arctic Ocean, all the oceans are linked and connected. It's happening around the world. And as our oceans become more acidic, the coral reefs that feed the marine lives that we rely on so much. Some have bleaching, which is a different thing, but they're also being eroded and they're not able to grow. Now, if we don't change things by the end of this century, they will actually start to corrode and become less. Not just the marine life will suffer, but also humankind will, because these coral reefs, they protect us from winds, storms, and tsunamis. This beautiful thing, you can't see it with the eye, is the zooplankton, and it can't make its armor because the 
actual chemistry is changing and it's affecting how they can create their shells, which then means they're not reproducing because they're under stress. This beautiful phytoplankton is the plant life, which again is being affected and it can't produce as much. This is also the bottom of our food chain. The blooms are getting smaller and smaller. That's what's happening. So what can we do about it? We can make five small changes that will make a difference. Use your cars less. This isn't going to cost money. Make your homes more energy efficient. Use green energy. Buy locally and plan your meals so you don't waste anything. My big thing, bottled water. Why? We can buy water that has filters in. We can, we can do different things. And I would say to you, we all encourage each other. I myself do it to go through glass ceilings, to just do so much more with ourselves, to achieve our dreams, and we do it in sport. But actually, I'm not a politician, I'm not a scientist, I'm a mother with four children now. <laughs> Beautiful Sarah. And I would say if we could use a little bit of that energy to put into the world that we love, instead of having a corrosive seas, our children, our children's children, we can make it a better place to live. So make the small changes for the world you live in. Thank you.